is truly El Shaddai, the Almighty and all sufficient. I want you to wave your hands and give Him glory and give Him praise. El Shaddai means He's Almighty, and it also means He's all sufficient. God has a million ways to bless you when He wants to bless you. That's what He means. He can turn your situation around. He can turn your night to morning. He can raise even the hiddens to do his will concerning you. In Jesus' name. Father, tonight I pray along with your people that your power will be present here. I pray that you will teach us your word. Let your word come with wisdom. I pray that your presence will saturate this place. I pray tonight, Lord, under the auspices of the ministry of your word and your spirit, that yokes will be broken. That yokes will be broken. That burdens will be lifted. Let there be liberty for the captives. Let your children be transported into richer experiences in you in jesus precious name amen amen, amen. shout a big big amen. amen shout a bigger amen. amen i want you to just shake the hands of somebody by your side your left and your right and just welcome them Tell them tonight is their night for an encounter. Hallelujah. Please be seated in the presence of God. I will worship you forever. Love you forever because this God is too good. Oh, I will worship you forever, love you forever because this God is too good. Oh, I will worship you. Forever love me, forever because this God is too good. You know, that I'm speaking today is a miracle, actually. Last night, when I got up to pray, my voice went off. I couldn't talk. I mean, I couldn't talk. I could not make a sound. This morning while we were praying, and they, they noticed that I was as quiet as possible. And even to this afternoon, the voice was not coming. So I think it's a miracle that God has healed me today. Maybe if you are not a preacher or a singer, you don't know what it means to lose your voice. This is my power. Amen. Uh -huh. An engineer's skill is in his hand and is in his brain. My own is in this place. Amen. And I'm so grateful to God for the healing tonight. And it tells me that tonight God is set to visit his people. I told us in one of our services that it's never lack of power or it's never insufficiency in God's part to reach out to his people it's always lack of faith and every time before you, you come before the presence of God you must be expectant for what God will do and I trust that the Lord will glorify his name in Jesus name please while you are seated can you just pray in the spirit if you can for just 50 60 seconds just pray in the spirit and build yourself. You can sit down. Don't worry. Everybody. 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 Be part of this session of the meeting and pray. 
build up your most holy faith rosa halada branda hashkida le provos kapanda braski skiva hazagara kate kilos kobronde skiva radas kapala garias kobronde skibra hazana Roscova ze sole de brandi de scuva hadra sidas Lorosco do brahadaba those of you online whether you are home or in your office or in your car be part of this atmosphere let the presence of god that is here saturate you wherever you are in whatever state whatever city whatever nation Glora bashanda rabahaskia but now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Roski la habranda baskeva hasoda. This God is so good. Oh, alaraha basko proska bahata. Lero roso braha samate ila hasoba. Thank you, Jesus. Kora habashka. Are you praying? Are you praying? Don't be quiet. Open your mouth and pray in the spirit. In the spirit. In the spirit. In the spirit. You are creating an atmosphere for the spirit of God to move. You are creating the right atmosphere to receive the word with faith. The things of the spirit are atmospheric. In nature, you have to learn to cultivate the right atmosphere. Arisiki bahata la namanda braske berona hasi. Shana na na de na 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 na. Shikola raba. You get the glory. You get the praise. You take the honor. Just wanna say thank you. Thank you, Father. The Lord is going to break yokes tonight. There are people that will be set free. It doesn't matter how the service looks now. I'm just telling you what's going to happen. There's a particular spirit that God wants to break his hold in the life of some people here. It will happen before the end of this service. You will be set free tonight. I don't want to mention it because it's something very private. But that yoke is coming down tonight. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord showed me in a vision today. And I just want to declare it before we go into the word and allow the Holy Spirit to activate it in the course of the meeting. Uh, this is for somebody here. Uh, in your family, I don't know who you are, whether you are here or you're online. Uh, there is somebody in your family this is like a sibling like a brother and he's been the family has been having problems with this person um, from what the Lord showed me it looks like this person is very stubborn and um, not calm-headed doesn't take advice doesn't listen and the person I saw in my vision is not married is dark in complexion but you are currently involved with a girl and as I speak by the Spirit of God in a real-time vision that girl um, her hair is not made you know women make their hair her hair now right now right now that girl's hair is not made so uh, the family this is somebody who doesn't listen and you know the family is afraid because 
of a lot of impending um, dangers around this person. But the Lord said he's going to break the stronghold over the mind of this person. He's going to set him free. I saw someone who was dark in complexion and a bit tall. You're not married, but you're involved with a girl right now. And uh, the way her hair is packed, she's not, she has not made her hair now. Now. And this girl is an evil influence in this person's life. But tonight, in the course of this meeting, God is going to break that stronghold. And God said, I should announce to that family that he's restoring that person. In the name of Jesus. God is up to something good this season. There's a wind of the spirit that is blowing. Bringing about change, restoration, transformation in the life of his people. Everywhere across um, in the life of God's people. And I saw a vision again of uh, this is like a similitude. Listen carefully. This person is not a person. God was just trying to illustrate something to me. I saw somebody and I saw a cloth. And this person was supposed to put on this cloth. It's a new cloth. But the cloth seems to be bigger than the person. Is an oversize. But rather than the clothes being slim fitted, just bring it down a little. Just bring it down a little and just play softly, just flow. Rather than the clothes being slim fitted, I heard the Lord said that He's going to increase the weight of the person to match with the clothes. And here is the message or the prophecy from that vision. That the Lord is about to open a season for somebody here. But he needs to give you capacity to contain that season. There's a dimension of abundance, a dimension of breakthrough, a dimension of increase that is coming to you. But you need capacity to contain, to manage, and to stay in it. There's a dimension of the anointing that is coming to you, but you need capacity. And so God came to declare this afternoon. That is releasing grace for capacity. Grace for enlargement. It says a little one shall become a thousand. And a small one a strong nation. I the Lord will hasten it in its time. The word time there means a particular season. A set time. An opportunity. I don't know what it is that is about to open up for you. But God is increasing you and giving you capacity to manage it. So get ready for the overflow. Get ready for super abundance. Get ready for greatness. Your amen needs to come alive. I hope you know I'm not joking. I'm telling you what the Lord is saying. Get ready. And I decided to announce it now because at the course of the meeting, the Spirit of God will begin to move. You see, when we, see, when we come like this, <laughs> see, Beyond your physical senses, the spirit, there is spiritual activity happening here. There are a lot of dispersion going on. Things are being dispatched to people under the auspices of the world. And it is important that you are connected by faith and you are sensitive. In fact, there's somebody here who needs healing. And God said, you're not going to wait till miracle service. He's going to heal you here. Before we stand up, that affliction is leaving your body. You will testify. I just heard that now. You will testify. Before we get up on our feet again, the affliction you will discover is gone. In the name of Jesus. You hear the testimony of our brother. While we were worshiping here, somebody boggled his house. But the angel of the Lord's presence left here to that place. That's why you must be very sensitive and concentrate when you come before God's presence. It's not for God's sake, it's for your sake. You understand? God is going to do mighty things today. In the name of Jesus. So we've been on a series uh, the last two Sundays, The Need for Priesthood. And uh, for those of us who have not been around, I, I would encourage you to get the messages 
on our online platform or you can meet the media department uh, after now. We started by talking about the place of prayer as the primary sacrifice for every believer. The Bible encourages us to know that we are priests and kings. God created us to function as priests on the earth. When I explain who a priest is, I said a priest is an intermediary personality. It's one that stands between divinity and humanity. God needs man to connect with men. Amen. Yeah, and last week we saw another aspect of it, offering spiritual sacrifices. That was the part two of it. And um, we spoke about the sacrifice of consecration. Every priest is meant to offer a sacrifice that arouses the interest of the divine spirit to intervene and to interfere. And I don't want to talk much about it. I'll encourage you to get the message so we can squeeze in on the time we have today. Uh, we spoke about the sacrifice of consecration. That if you must walk as a priest, because your dominion on earth as a believer is tied to the level of priesthood you exercise that you are able to stand between the realm of the spirit and the physical and then on the strength of your partnership with heaven invite god into your space that is what secures your dominion and your reigning on the earth so we spoke about the sacrifice of consecration that a priest must be separated set apart a lifestyle a culture that is determined only by god to the end that you are able to serve his will on earth we spoke about the sacrifice of consecration and of what again and of obedience obedience and i thought that we were done with that teaching but then some more was offloaded from heaven Oh, I received a download from heaven this week and I want to share with us so we'll continue the series again the need for priesthood part 3 the need for priesthood part 3 last week the sub topic was uh, offering up spiritual sacrifice this week the sub topic is the rise of a mediator the rise of a mediator the rise of a mediator i want to beg us tonight to be attentive because we are going deep this night and we are going to pray the lord laid it on my heart for us to take out some minutes to intercede on behalf of our families there's something that god wants to do in this season so as as i teach i want you to Allow the word of God to stir up faith in your spirit and understanding. And get ready to pray. And there will be a shift after tonight. I said there will be a shift after tonight. In the name of Jesus. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5. Please say this after me. Without God, man cannot. Without man, God will not. Let's try it again. Without God, man cannot. And without man, God will not. So do you remember? So can we say it again? At the count of three, one, two, three. Without God, man cannot. Without man, God. You may want to write that in front of your jota because that is a very powerful principle that will help you for a very long time in your Christian journey. Without God, man cannot. It is only with God that all things are possible. He's sovereign. He's almighty. But without man, God will not.
that means that if God doesn't find a man in a generation, the purposes of God for that generation can be delayed. So God is always at the mercy of men as far as his move is concerned. And you are here tonight because God wants to raise you as that man for your generation. You know, when Gideon was to go to battle, 32,000 gathered. God said, this is not what I'm looking for. He said, I'm looking for a man. And at the end of the day, he had only 300 soldiers to go with. So most times, when God will look for men that he will use, um, he may not always go with the number. But God is such a God that he can multiply the strength of a thousand men in one man. He sent just one man to Egypt. And that one man humbled the entire dynasty. An empire of Egypt. You are here tonight because God wants to empower you. I thought I hear a big amen. amen. You are here tonight because God wants to put something on your life that will make you a representative of his to your generation in Jesus' name. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. Say the last four words together. One to go. The man. That tells you that this, this scripture gives you a revelation of the state of Jesus Christ in heaven. Amen. I know a lot of Christians feel that now Jesus is a spirit. No. When Jesus resurrected, he resurrected with another body. He resurrected as a man. It is true that in 1 Corinthians 15, the Bible calls him the life-giving spirit. That speaks about his divine nature. But when Jesus came on earth, he came in the form of a man. The reason is because it will take a man to undo uh, what sin had brought upon the race of mankind. It will take a man to satisfy the claims of divine justice. In the laws of intercession, for you to be able to intercede for people or stand on behalf of a people, you have to be in their nature or you have to go through what they have gone through. So the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 2 that we do not have a high priest that is not touched with the same infirmities as us. The Bible says he was tempted in all faults as we are. He went through everything that we went through so that he can uh, make the captain of our salvation perfect, as the Bible says in Hebrews. So when he died on the cross, he died as a man. When he resurrected, he resurrected as a man. And he ascended to heaven in that form. That means that the only person in human flesh in heaven is Jesus. God is spirit. The angels are all spirits. For he maketh his angels spirit. And his ministers flames of fire. It is only Jesus that decided. I don't know. That sacrifice is something you need to think about. That Jesus would decide for the rest of eternity to live as a man in flesh. When he appeared to the disciples, when Thomas was there, he told him, he said, touch the very holes of the nails in my hands, my feet, and the hole where the spear pierced my side. So Jesus still had all the injuries. That means when Jesus died, the only thing that left him was the blood. The reason was because the life of flesh is in blood. That's why I say you should listen this night. Because I want to be calm to be able to explain some things to us. The Bible says the life of flesh is in his blood. So when Jesus was on earth, he had human life because he had blood in himself. But when he died, that blood was drained out and he took it to heaven like he told Mary in John. To offer it up as an atonement for the sins of mankind. So Jesus no longer had blood in himself. What he had was flesh and bone. 
That's the reason why when he appeared to his disciples in Luke chapter 24, he told them, handle me, for a spirit hath not flesh and bone. So Jesus right now is not a spirit. He's a man. Did you hear what I said? And the Bible says there is one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 33 to 34. Another scripture. This means that Jesus is the number one example of who a mediator is. I'm going to explain who a mediator is in a moment. But the perfect example we have from scripture is Jesus. Are you there in Romans 8, 33? Media, please help me quickly. 33 and 34. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God. Who also makes intercession. For who? For who? So Christ is at the right hand of God making intercession. Now Jesus Christ is seated in heaven as king. Yet, the Bible says he is performing the function of a priest by making intercession. A king sits down. Isn't it? To judge and to rule. But a priest has to stand to perform or to carry out his priestly duties. And Jesus is the only one that we find the combination of the kingly and the priestly dimension. And remember the Bible says we are in his kind. So while he is seated as king at the right hand of God's power, meaning that everything about our salvation has been concluded, he is yet interceding in his seated position. And the Bible says he is making intercession on our behalf. That's the reason why you don't have to be worried when people don't pray for you. Even though it's good for people to pray for you. Because the Bible says Jesus himself is interceding on your behalf. The Bible says he that keepeth Israel neither sleep nor slumber. So even when you are weak, that's the reason why your weakness, the message of God is still speaking for you. You know why? Because Jesus is making intercession for you. You'll catch that when you get home. And of course, if you read this same chapter verse 26 and 27 the bible also speaks about the holy spirit making intercession for us the bible says the spirit maketh intercession with groanings that cannot be uttered so why jesus christ is interceding for us in the heavenlies there has to be a participation and a partnership between heaven and earth for that intercession and that priestly function to be complete so jesus is in heaven carrying out the ministry of intercession and the Holy Spirit is on earth through the saint partnering with the ministry of intercession with Jesus. Did you hear what I said? That's why Revelation says the spirit and the bride says come. He does the intercession through us. Of course, the spirit doesn't have body. The spirit doesn't have mouth. If a spirit must speak, he must speak through a fleshly medium. So every time you pray, what you are doing is you are partnering with the intercessory ministry of Jesus. That is the only thing that he's doing consistently. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 7 and in verse 25 that he liveth to make intercession for us continually. Continually. So who is a mediator? Number one, a mediator is a go-between. A mediator is a go-between. A mediator is a go-between two entities. Number two, a mediator is a gap bridger. In Ezekiel 22 verse 30, he says, I sought for a man that will stand in the gap. 
on behalf of the land. A mediator is a gap bridger. Is the one that connects the space between two points or two individuals or two entities. Number three, a mediator is one who advocates for peace and common understanding. Is one who advocates for peace and, un and common understanding. Now in the United Nations, there are what they call peace uh, peace delegates, isn't it? Look up here. There are people they call peace delegates. So if there is conflict between two nations, they will send these guys, they are diplomats. They are trained to come in the midst of a conflict and broker peace. So they are able to secure understanding between two ends. So like what is happening between Russia and Ukraine is because the both of them have refused peace or one of them have refused peace. Amen? So usually they will send diplomats. In fact, they will send a force they call peacekeeping force. Military soldiers, but they don't go to kill. They go to keep peace because sometimes people are bent on causing violence. Just like the coup that is happening in three African nations now. So you see that um, ECOWAS had to send some delegates. The chief of that team being um, the former president, good luck, Jonathan. So they will send them to these guys. They go there and create terms and conditions by which um, the nations in conflict or the government and the rebels can come to a common understanding. That's who a mediator is. Number four. A mediator is an intercessor. A mediator is an intercessor. This gives you the spiritual implications of who a mediator is now. Primarily, we understand intercession in the place of prayer. There are four basic levels of prayer. There is thanksgiving. There is supplication. There is intercession and then there is warfare. Amen? You'll find that in First Timothy chapter 2, but I'm not going there. So we understand that intercession primarily speaks about prayers. It's the dimension of prayer where an individual goes before God to mediate on behalf of an individual or a people. When that individual goes before God, stands in the gap, or prays the purposes of God over a people or an individual. Because God must be invited into the realm of man for him to demonstrate his power or for him to move or for his purpose to be fulfilled. Spirits don't just... You see, the realm of the spirit is a very legal realm. The realm of the spirit has respect for laws, has respect for regulations. It has complete justice system. And so in Genesis, from the day that God said, let them have dominion over the earth. From that time, God exempted himself from the affairs and the dealings of man. So God has to be invited on legal basis. That's the reason why somebody can be sick. And even though there is a provision for his healing in Christ Jesus, the healing does not automatically come in. That's the reason why snubbing a sickness is not healing. Did you hear what I said? Ah. If you are here, at least say amen. See, this thing, you see, the reason why we have to, it's time for us to start teaching deep things. Because a lot of believers are very ignorant about how the spirit realm operates. And it's time for the church, the last day church, if we must be strong enough to establish the kingdom of God on this earth, we must grow beyond the milk we have been drinking. We must begin to look for the deep things of God and feed on it. 
thank God for God bless you gospel. But that is not enough to build a man. The Bible says that a man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto good works. You need more than God bless you gospel to be built up. You need something that triggers all the potentials you carry in your spirit man. So that when there is an invasion of darkness over your family, you can stand there and stay the hand of the enemy. You can stand and legislate on behalf of God. You can become the move of God because the move of God is when men arise. The move of God is not God moving. God is a spirit. He cannot move. He needs a physical locomotive to move. Oh, you don't understand what I'm saying. Let me change the message. It's like we didn't come ready for this one. Let's, what message should we teach on? What do you want us to talk about? No, what do you, just give me anything you want. Let's just talk. Let's talk about abundance, va? I'm a messenger. That's what an apostle is. I, I can't, anything you want us to talk, we can talk about because that's it. But can we, can we begin to crack some bones in the word of God? This teaching is designed for you to become a mighty man. So if I don't get a response again, I'll, I'll change the topic. Amen? Give me Proverbs 25 verse 15. So a mediator is a go between two entities, a gap bridger, one who advocates for peace and common understanding, and a mediator is also an intercessor. He said, by long forbearance, a ruler is persuaded. That's the character of intercession. Long forbearance. By long forbearance. This is, if you are viewing this in the aspect of prayer, <laughs> this is the aspect that makes you to stay on a matter until you get the response from heaven. Sadly, not many Christians get to this point. Many, many Christians are still practicing the Old Testament as New Testament believers. What do I mean? In the Old Testament, the priest was the one that did the prayer for the people, that did everything for the people. And then he will come out according to Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 and 25, where God told them, he said, on this wise shall you bless the people. He said, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon that's what many christians want a mighty man that will just come and say god bless you shake his hand like this and the trouble goes and why we are anointed for that that is not the real reason for why we are anointed that is like a makeshift arrangement otherwise the moment god took israel out of egypt with by, uh, by the hand of moses why was it that the first thing god did was to take them to the Mount Sinai and introduce them to his laws. Why did he want them to know his laws? The reason is because it is a citizen of a country that should know the laws, the rules, and regulations of that country and oblige by it. That means God was looking for partnership. So keep that scripture. It says, by long forbearance, that if you view intercession in the place of prayer, it means that you need to have a character that allows you to persevere. Do you have another translation, an easier translation than New, new Living Translation or something? It said, through patience, a ruler can be persuaded. And God is king and is ruler over all. Through patience. So when a man understands the place of intercession, and understand how to mediate between God and man and is ready to be patient enough even God can be persuaded and a gentle tongue can break a bow that means your most powerful prayers are not the prayers you pray exerting all your energy 
your most powerful prayers are those prayers you you stay long on or you are consistent on can i digress a little i'm big i big i noticed something recently by experience this time around now why it is good to pray loud okay but i notice that there is a dimension of spiritual power that you can only tap into when you begin to understand the fact that god does not pick your prayer from your lips he picks it from your heart so all those ba -ba 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 at best i'm not saying god doesn't answer that but i'm just saying that at best that can just edify you because the bible says he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself but when a prayer comes god will check the connection of that thing in your mouth to your heart so the real place where prayer is manufactured is in the heart that's why he told daniel the angel told daniel he said from the day you set your heart not your mouth that means that i can be in a bus quietly and incense volume of incense is rising as prayers from my heart and on the strength of that prayer things can be displaced in the heavenlies that's when you begin to get into the very depth of prayer that's when your prayer begins to move things in the spirit oh god i i feel I'm, I'm talking to a few people tonight so a mediator is an intercessor a mediator is an individual system hear this a mediator is an individual system for the defense of territorial integrity a mediator is an individual system for the defense of territorial integrity is an individual system now of course you know that that's a figure of speech individual system individual should have referred to a single entity or a unit individual yes or no yes or no i know those online are following me i hope those on ground are following me what is it that the teaching is not interesting or is strange We've not started we've not gone anywhere this night i want to teach you spiritual intelligence i want us to come to a point where you become intelligent in spiritual things where you can pray intelligently and 10 out of 10 times your prayer produces result i want to empower you this night You know, empowerment is when you give power to the people. It's not when you use the power for the people. And that's what we are called to do. We are called to empower the body of Christ. If we must bring God on the scene, if we must see God move, if we must see the last day church arise and step into her prophetic destiny, if we must see cities nations and territories changed there are intelligences we must get from the word of god because the kingdom of darkness is training their ground troops every agent of darkness now is going through series and levels of education so it seems as though a witch is more powerful than a believer no it's just that the witch is more trained in demonic intelligence, DI, than a believer is trained in spiritual intelligence, SI. You know, there is artificial intelligence, there is demonic intelligence, there is spiritual intelligence. I hope you know. Some of you don't even know artificial intelligence. What do you have in your hand? Is that not a phone? That phone operates by artificial intelligence. That means the phone has an inbuilt ability of cognition the phone has an imbued ability to respond just the way you have artificial intelligence you have spiritual intelligence 
and if you understand spiritual intelligence deep oh my god now how many of you have seen me during the super sundays sometimes or during miracle service sometimes you see when i minister to people i can i will just call them and say look at me and then all of a sudden something is transmitted now what that is not luck that is the operation of spiritual intelligence what you are not seeing is principles behind that occurrence how that power can be transmitted from one medium to another medium wirelessly you know that's wireless now hey it's like let's change the teaching they didn't come prepared for i came heavy this night So a mediator is an individual system for the defense of territorial integrity if god wants to secure a territory he looks for one man and he puts the strength that is capable or the mechanism or the efficiency capable of defending an entire territory i'll give you an example there was a man that jesus met he was a madman the bible called the place where jesus met him was called gadara now every time you read scripture sometimes the understanding of scripture is contained in the interpretation of the words used sometimes for instance if you read numbers 23 can i go on oh by the way there's somebody with headache migraine headache now and as i'm talking is lifting is lifting from your head now you are being healed your head will begin to feel light that's what you you begin to feel it for instance in numbers 23 when balak called balaam to curse the children of israel the bible says that balak took balaam to a place called bamot baal and that place was a hill. Bamot Baal means the high places of Baal. So that he could cross the children of Israel from that height. Why was height needed? Why was there need for positional advantage to cross the children of Israel? Sit down please. Thank you sir. Questions like that introduce you to spiritual intelligence. And the possibilities you see in your life is equivalent to how much spiritual intelligence is operating in your life that means if you are a believer and they can still fire you arrow you are bankrupt to a level of the intelligences of the of the spirit because there are things you can know that will not allow those arrows come to you the Bible says, No evil shall befall thee, neither shall any play come near your dwelling. So the reason why they needed positional advantage was because in the realm of the spirit, position determines possession. That you are advantaged at your vantage point. That's what it means. Of course, you know, Baal was a god that was worshipped by the Canaanite nations. Baal was the god that represented the summit or the peak of carnality, sensuality, sexual immorality. So the reason why they had to go to that height was because for you to weaken the defenses, spiritual defenses of that nation, you had to increase carnality amongst them that will make the covenant they had with god broken so that their defense or their territorial defense had been breached the integrity of their ter 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 territorial defense had been breached and then the enemy can invade them so med a mediator is an individual what system and jesus met that madman the bible says he met him in gadara 
Gadara means walls. Gadara was a city in a region called Decapolis. Decapolis means 10 cities. Walls, 10 cities. Walls also speaks of defense because in those days, cities built walls around them to defend them against the onslaught or the invasion of the enemy. So the higher the walls or the thickness of the walls determined the defense you had against the enemy. Just like Jericho's wall was so thick that seven chariots could walk upon. Jesus met a man that had a demon in a city called Defense, in a region called Decapolis. That means that the demonic stronghold that had barricaded that region and separated it from the light of the gospel that Jesus was preaching was captured in that one man that man was carrying a demonic entourage that was enough to strengthen the defense of 10 cities so when jesus asked him what is your name he said my name is what legion now that man was a demonic mediator that's the reason why he started initiating discussions with jesus he said why have you come to take us out because just the way god must surround you and defend his integrity in your life so also when the devil captures a man to enslave that man or that nation or that city he must build a system round about it's called a stronghold now there are individuals there are human beings that god has imparted to serve as mediators in along this line that their presence in a place is the defense of that place their presence in the family is the securing of the territorial integrity of that family why did he say there is no enchantment against jacob neither is there any divination against israel jacob is a person israel is a nation because jacob was the one that had the covenant that secured the nation of israel i wish i'm talking to people here it's time for it's time for us to begin to go deep it's time for us to let us begin to understand what christianity is let's come out of religion and come into reality the rise of a mediator so i've showed you from scripture how that jesus is the perfect example of a mediator and the four definitions i gave you about a mediator is what you see in Christ Jesus but let's look at some other examples in scripture and perhaps learn some principles before we stand to pray number one let's look at the example of a man called Abraham Rashkaba alashka brasku vebile sobro di belehida supra. Your shamra has kadiva. There's an anointing this night to judge the power of witchcraft. I tell you, I sense it here. Abraham. Let's look at the example of a man called Abraham. Genesis chapter 18, verse 22 to 33. And then we'll read chapter 19, verse 27 to 29. Genesis 18, verse 22 to 33. The men turned, give me New King James, the normal translation. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. I want you to take note of the word stood. Abraham still stood before the Lord. The reason is because that Abraham, of course, we know the story, so I won't bother you about the story. God visited Abraham in form of three men. He came as Lord and two angels with him. And then he left. He was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. So we know the whole story, but I want to pick out some of the intelligences that we can get on the life of a mediator. Because God wants to raise us as mediators for our families this night so that word stood there is very important as long as the context is concerned because in abraham's life for instance we see 
two dimensions of intercession revealed abraham was a man that demonstrated two dimensions of intercession i told you primarily that intercession had to do with prayer isn't it now we see two dimensions of that from abraham's life the first dimension we see is the stance or the positional approach the bible says abraham still stood before the lord because when we go to chapter 19 at the end of the day the reason why god didn't destroy sodom and gomorrah was because the bible says abraham went back to the place where he stood so there is positional approach when a man will be will stand between god and a people the bible says in ephesians chapter 6 from verse 11 it says, put on the whole armor of god so that you'll be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy the wiles the word wiles there means schemes or methods he said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And then in verse 13, he says, therefore put on the armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, verse 14, stand therefore. So verse 11 to verse 14, you have the word stand mentioned four times. Not because there was, there was lack of words but because there was something about that positional approach there when the bible says stand it's talking about fervency of spirit having done all to stand you cannot be a go-between if you have not sustained the power and the endurance to stand and you see that in the life of abraham let's go on i'll show you the next dimension of intercession and Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. Would you also destroy the place? This is a man bargaining with God. This is a man, a mortal man, flesh, bargaining with the God of heaven and earth. Bargaining with the spirit of spirit. Who gave him the boldness to stand before this is a god that the bible says the earth trembles at his presence but here is a mortal man standing before god making negotiations the rise of a mediator he said would you also destroy this place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it go on for, he said far be it from you you know what that means he said i forbid you that's what it means I, I want you to imagine this okay okay he stood before god we can handle that then he started making negotiations with god why we are trying to handle that here is a man rebuking god he said far be it from you in other words i forbid you or i dare you that's a man and the bible did not say in the next verse that god complained rather the bible says in the next verse god received his terms and conditions is it possible to get to that point as a man you know the kind of prayer we have been used to in church the prayer where we feel we, we just beg god we are just surviving by the instincts of the mercies of god as though god is one angry god getting ready to destroy us so we are just dangling with the last strand of his mercy so when we come before him we come and beg him and say god but here is a man standing before god and he said far be it for you from and the bible says god what did god say in the next verse wait, wait, let's go back to that verse let me show you something here he said far be it from you to do such a thing as this to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous should be as the wicked he said far be it from you two times shall not the judge of the earth do right now he's beginning to teach god what to do you know what your boldness before the throne of grace is based on how much knowledge of the one that occupies that throne that you have so when you go to pray i can understand your stature before god 
because your knowledge of God will be revealed by what you do there. Have you come to a point where you can negotiate on behalf of God and a people? Like Abraham did. Next verse. 26, I believe. That's the next verse. So the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Go to verse 33. So Abraham continually bargained from 50, went to 45, to 40, to 20, 30, 20, 10. And the Bible says, when he got to 10, so the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham. I guess God felt if I, uh, if I continue standing here, this guy can negotiate till number one. So after Abraham said, will you destroy if you find 10 righteous? God said, I will not. God said, no, if I leave, if I don't leave now. This guy, will, he will move it to one. That's why I read that scripture in Proverbs. It say, by long forbearance, a ruler is persuaded. If you want to be a mediator between God, between divinity and humanity, you will have to learn how to persevere. You will have to learn how to stay on the negotiation table with God. So you, you just thought prayer was to fulfill righteousness. I'm showing you how that prayer has entered into a business transaction. Verse 33. So the Lord went his way and Abraham returned to his place. Now give us chapter 19 verse 27. Okay, first of all, give us verse 29. Let me show you the second aspect of intercession. I showed you the first one as the stance or the positional approach. No, 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 no. I mean chapter 18, verse 29. Chapter 18, verse 29. Look for the verse where it says, I am but dust. I am but dust to speak to God. Look for that verse. I want to show you the second aspect. That's verse 27, media. Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed now, I, I who am but dust and ashes, have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. This is the second aspect of intercession. This one is called the heart or humility approach. So Abraham felt that God may become angry because of his confidence and he decided to humble himself. Now when you are entering into the place of intercession in prayers, you must understand and apply these two aspects. The positional or stance approach and the humility or heart approach. The stance there speaks about the knowledge of God that you have well enough to be able to transact with Him and intermediate on behalf of people. The humility approach means that you humble yourself before God. Just in case God is angry with the person or the people that you are, intermedi you are mediating for so that in your humility the anger of God can be pacified. Did your Bible not say in 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14 if my people that are called by my name shall do what? Humble first. So when you need to go into a season of intercession you need to also understand the your humility approach. That is the place where you will have to go before God and repent. Because sometimes the reason why the Satan is resisting some families or resisting some individuals is probably because there is a legal reason. A legal reason means that they did something that legally permitted Satan to come into that life or that family to resist them. Most times if you experience a uh, uh, um, 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 delay in deliverance if you are praying deliverance for a family or for a person and you experience delay or a resistance there could be legal issues 
there possibly may be sins committed that is preventing God from moving. Because God said in his word, he said, he visits the sins of the fathers to the children, to the third and fourth. So why is this woman not being able to carry a child? Maybe there were legal issues in the past. So when you understand the humility approach, you are able to go before God. I hope I'm helping somebody. I'm not just talking. You are able to go before God and repent. Maybe that's the reason why for two years you have been praying for that person and there's no solution. It's not because God is not hearing your prayer. It's just that your prayer is not captured within the right template. God is, God is so wise and intelligent that you don't do dafaduka when you want to do business with God. God has principles. Enough of dafaduka prayers. We find, you know what dafaduka is in Hausa? We just do it anyhow. I think it goes. <laughs> Doesn't go like that too. Please be seated. God is the God of protocol. There is a principle to be observed for any time a man must initiate the hands of God. He says, if my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. That's why you cannot be a mediator and still be practicing evil and still be living in sin. That's why we started with the teaching of last week. We had to talk about consecration first. Because before God can use you as a go-between, you yourself. I know somebody's feeling comfortable. Pastor is beginning to sound judgmental. No, 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 no. I'm helping you. That's why even on the cross, Jesus could still pray. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Had Jesus not prayed that prayer, the nation of Israel would have been cursed. You know why? Because they were already committing sin. The Bible says, thou shalt not murder. And they were killing not just an innocent man, they were killing a righteous man. So before Jesus would die, he had to pray that prayer on the cross. He said, forgive them for they know not. The reason he had the stature to make that prayer was because he was sinless in himself. Though the Bible says he took the sin of the world. God must raise you as a mediator. The world is in need of mediators. Every city and every territory that is dead spiritually, every church that is dead spiritually is in need of mediator. There has to be the rise of mediators. Otherwise, forget about the move of God in a generation. When you say the move of God, the one word that captures that sentence is the word mediator. That God has men that can represent him on the earth. And I tell you that a mediator is powerful. Elijah told the king, he said, before God whom I stand, One man shut the heavens. One man brought the people back to God. One man opened the heavens and brought rain. One man established the next phase of political rulership for three nations. One man. But you find a family where people die anyhow. You find a family where there is delay of all kinds. All of them are bearing Christian name. First daughter, married, no child. Second daughter, out of wedlock, gave birth. Third child, not married. Fourth child, not married. What is missing there is a mediator, not marriage. There's no one sufficient enough. And what makes you powerful as a man of God, as a minister, is your mediative capacity. Because there are some things your anointing cannot move. It's your priesthood that will move it. Archbishop Edwin Sinedaus, I went to preach in a crusade. 
I don't know whether I was very tired or whatever. I don't know. I don't really know. Archbishop Benson did also have blessed memory. I implore you to study about that man. He's one of the patriarchs of what I call the gospel of the kingdom in Nigeria. Those are one of the men that opened the church in Nigeria to the race of heaven. There are the people that, that kick-started true Christianity. He went to preach somewhere in a crusade, large crusade, open air. And as soon as he mounted the podium, this was all he said. He took the mic. He said, Lord, let the rain fall so that the cripples can stand up and walk back home. He dropped the mic and he walked away. And as he was leaving, in less than five minutes, heavy rain fell in that crusade. And the crippled people that they brought with sticks and walk and chair stood up and began to walk home. If some of us would have, it would take us three, four hours to charge the place and get God there. But that's the power of one man. If God does not raise mediators in Nigeria, forget about 2023, I'm just telling you. How much is a dollar to nine? How much is a naira now to one dollar? You've not seen anything, no. God doesn't raise mediators in a family. You can have five graduates with two who have masters, and they will all be poor. Because when it comes to the realm of the spirit, whatever advantage you have in a natural stands for nothing. Your strongest ability in the natural is your weakest state spiritually. So this is a system that superimposes the hand of God. So one principle we learn, let's move on. From the life of Abraham as a mediator is that Abraham was an initiator of divine intervention. The first thing you need to know as we look at the life of Abraham here is that a mediator is an initiator of divine intervention. Give me chapter 19 of Genesis 27. Let me show you something there before we move on. Verse 27, chapter 19 of Genesis. Okay, I think I need to just open my Bible now. Okay. Chapter 19, verse 27. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Why did he go back there? Because that was the place of transaction. That was the place where he, 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 he was mediating before God on behalf of... Now, he was not mediating for Sodom and Gomorrah. He was mediating for Lot. You know, Lot was very foolish. This is not an insult. It's just practical explanation. Some of you, you are too insult driven. You guys say foolish. Say, ah, no, no, no. This is just practical expression. Lot was foolish. Lot thought he was rich because he had headsmen. Or because he had money. He didn't know that he was rich because of the promise that God had given to Abraham. So the Bible says in Genesis 12, don't go there. That when Abraham obeyed God and left his father's house, he took Lot with him. And because of Abraham, Lot was blessed. But because Lot was foolish about spiritual things, he began to fight. He became so proud. See, <laughs> Before you pray for breakthrough and blessing, pray for humility first. Because the money can control you. Please be seated. You know what I'm talking about? You don't know who you are till you have one million in your account first. And for those of you that have gotten one million, we can now look at your life and see who you really are. That period you had the one million what was going on in your heart and what you did thereafter just shows who is Lord over your life. So now you are broke. You don't know that God is taking you through a process. He wants to build the right virtue in you. You think God is too late. He's too slow in blessing you. You want to teach God how to help you. Have one million first. Have ten million first. Then sleep well as though you don't have anything. 
and walk around as though you don't have nothing, then we'll know that you are truly qualified to be blessed. But the moment you have one million, the next time you are passing a car shop, you tell your nabeb to stop. And you come down and just look there. You know, you know, when, <laughs> every time you have money in your pocket, check the way you behave. When you go to a supermarket or somewhere, all of a sudden, the young girl becomes a madam. Say, madam, put this one and put this one like this. How much be this one? You know, when somebody is going to buy on credit, eh, they'll just stand there and with humility begin to mention everything. Because they know at the end of the buying, they need to tell you, madam, this one a credit or a beg. <laughs> but the moment she has money, she'll even go and taste the gari, the gari that is there. Is that true? <laughs> they, this one, no, no, be Jebu Gari. This one, no, be. No, this one, this one, a Delta Gari. No, this. You know, they slap. Give me the one with the slap. And he has eaten one cup. Oh. Why? Because he has purchasing power. So Lot was so blessed and he forgot that the mediator was Abraham. And the Bible says even his men began to strive with Abraham's men. And when they separated and he went to Sodom, it became obvious that it was not him that God was with. It was Abraham. The Bible says Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Go on. We are reading down to verse 29. Then he looked towards Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And he saw and behold the smoke of the land which went up like the smoke of a furnace. Verse 29 and the last. And it came to pass when God had destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow. Why? Because God remembered. You know why? Abraham went back the next day and stood there. You know why? Abraham, you see, Abraham understands how to initiate divine intervention. He knows he has been dealing with God for years. So he knows what to do to get God into a matter. He first, he knows firstly that God is a God of covenant. And every time God cuts covenant with a man, God will seal that covenant by a sacrifice. And that sacrifice, the place where that sacrifice is offered becomes a memorial. So God is conscious about physical memorials. That's why every time God appeared to Abraham, he built an altar there and called that place a name. You know why? He's trying to remind God that this place, so, so time in history, you and I have a covenant. That's why he went back there and stood. I want to ask you a question. What memorial do you have before God? Everybody under the sound of my voice. What memorial? That's why the Bible says Jesus continually. He died. He refused to change the body. He took the same body that was injured and went to heaven. You know why? So that those wounds can be a memorial before God. Every time the scale of judgment is turning against the people of God, he shows God. He said, look at this. But believers don't understand memorial. That's why they treat God with cash. You, do you know that your coming here every week is a memorial before God? It would have been okay for you to sleep at home. Must I come every Sunday? That's the reason why church has to be meeting always. Though. You know, we are living in a day it, now, now. Now, the Nigerian church, there are some things we are copying from the western world that i feel we shouldn't copy for instance church will go on vacation at the end of the year they will hold one christmas carol service silent night holy night and after that they say we have clothes we'll come back in january then release the people into two weeks of carnality then they come back in january and start another 21 days fasting those days my father used to tell me Every time we were telling church, no go close. Must we have church every day? My father say, church is like police station. It doesn't close. 
Then I thought it was wickedness. But with the understanding of priesthood, I understand what it means. Shut down a church or shut down the church in a city. That's why I say anything that makes you want to be consistent for God, Satan fights it. You know why? He's fighting memorials. He knows that your, your purchasing power, your transacting power in prayers is based on how much memorials you have. So Satan wants to make sure your shelf is clear of memorials. You think God doesn't remember your serving in the house of God every day? The Bible says God is not a taskmaster to forget our labor. It's we that forget, it's not God. Memorials. Please be seated. Abraham stood in that place. To be an initiator of divine intervention, you must have the skill and understanding of the ways of God. You must understand the justice system of God. You must understand how God operates. On the strength of that understanding is how you can initiate God to a matter. God was going to wipe out an entire city. But Abraham understood the terms and conditions to enter into a bargain with Jehovah. The mediator is one that initiates or is an initiator of divine intervention. Number two, and then we'll pray. Let's look at the life of Moses, Ezekiel, uh, Exodus rather, Moses' life, Exodus chapter 3, verse 7 to 8, and then chapter 4, verse 24 to 26. Moses was another mediator in scripture. Moses, by reason of his communion with God, he was a man that was able to tap into a lot of spiritual intelligence. In fact, the first time the word, the phrase, man of God is used in scripture, it was used in reference to Moses. Moses was the first example of man of God. Even Adam, it wasn't used for him. That word man of God, in true sense, it is man God. What they meant in those days was half man, half God. It is in English that it was now coined to man of God, meaning one that proceeds from God. And why would they not say that? Everything about Moses' life was supernatural. One of those days, he came down from the mountain. And the Bible says that Shekinah glory that was on the mountain covered his face. They had to cover him so that they can talk to him. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 34 that there was no prophet again like Moses all through Israel it was because of the intelligence that Moses had gained in spiritual things Moses tapped into the eternal dimensions of God that he was able to go a yawns beyond time and see what happened and he wrote a book called Genesis Moses was a man that possessed so much knowledge of the things of God. And I told you during the Super Sunday that I guess that's the reason why, maybe, that's the reason why Satan came for his body. Moses had trapped so much of the nature and the personality of God in his life. Even his body began to light. I guess that's why when he died, Satan came for his body. Because Satan felt, hey, this human suit, if I wear it, I will cause, in fact, I can overthrow God. That a man can be this powerful. So in other words, Satan needed impartation. That's why he went for Moses' body. And God did not argue. God had to send an angel to contend. Because God knew that the impartation of the anointing in Moses' body was something else. Exodus chapter 3 verse 7. Let's look at his life. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the... This is God talking to Moses. He met him at the burning bush. 40 years after Moses ran away from Egypt. He had forgotten about Egypt. 
he was now living he was now an old man he had a wife and two children he was now a shepherd a prince that was supposed to be a king was reduced to following sheep in the bush he was living another version of himself just like some of you now because of the pressures of life this is not part of the message i'm saying it prophetically some of you because of the pressures of life and the things you have gone through the too many battles you have fought you have given into despair and discouragement and you are now living a, an inferior version of yourself what you have is a false identity about yourself it was in this state that god appeared to moses and i pray that god will appear to such a one this season and the lord said i've surely seen the oppression of my people who are in egypt and i've heard their cry because of their taskmasters for i know their sorrows go on verse 8 so i have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the egyptians this is an incorrect statement or god was not saying the truth i don't know how you read your bible don't just read blindly ask questions so i have come down to deliver them he's talking to a man in another land median about his people in another land egypt and he's telling that man there that i have come down to deliver my people in egypt if you want to come down come down in egypt now no be so it's just like god has seen or god wants to liberate his people in chicago united states and he comes to your bedroom you in london chicky and he comes and he appears to you he said i've seen the reproach of my people in chicago illinois and i've come down what where what is you are displaced god go go travel to new york airport land there then from here take another flight to chicago so it's either that statement was a lie from god or it was not correct but it was correct you know why when god said i have come down what he was saying is i have found the mediator so in the whole of egypt god could not find one man he had to travel hundreds of miles to Midian. Chapter 4. Ah, we are going to pray. There is power in this place. There is power in this place. Chapter 4, verse 24. So Moses was on his way now to Egypt. He has accepted the call. And it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. The same man God sent is on his way to deliver God's assignment. And the Bible says God met him to kill him. Have you seen this scripture before? I know some of us have not seen it. Eh? Your one year reading plan, you have not gotten to this place. And God met him and sought. If the Bible says and God met him to kill him, no problem. The Bible says God sought to kill him. Why? Next verse. We are reading down to verse 26. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me. Verse 26. So he let him go. Then she said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. Moses didn't understand that for you to be used by God, you must be consecrated. He was not circumcised and he wanted to be used by God. He was still, he didn't carry the mark that made him divine. He had not gone through the procedure that will make him separated unto God. So he was being viewed by God as an enemy. That's the reason why when God calls you before he sends you, he makes you. He circumcises your heart. I want to be a kingdom financier. God will so circumcise your heart about money, you will give and people think you are a fool. Then you are qualified to be a kingdom financier. Not the one that says, I want to be a kingdom financier. And as blessed as he is, he has never given God 5,000 naira offering. He still squeezes his offering and comes to... You are, you are not ready. 
Moses did not understand the place of circumcision and sacrifices. Every man that God had met before that time, there was a sacrifice, something to seal the covenant. But Moses just took his rod and was on his way. Now, this tells you, for his, this that his wife did, that saved his life, tells you that Moses was so knowledgeable about priesthood that he had taught his wife. How did the wife know that by the shedding of blood, the sentence of death, when the Bible says God wanted to kill Moses, in the original Hebrew that it is written, it didn't say God came. What it meant was the angel of death came. Because the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 54, in verse 16, he said, I have created the destroyer to waste. The destroyer is Satan. It's one of his names. So sometimes God employs the services of the devil. If God wants to bring judgment on a place, he employs the services of the devil. So don't go about and say God is an angry God. No, no. So when the Bible says the Lord appeared, the, in the original Hebrew, it meant that the angel of death, which was Satan, came to kill Moses. Even though God had sent Moses. But the angel of death, Satan wanted to cut him off from fulfilling his destiny. So there had to be a priestly activity to save Moses' life. Just the way when God calls you and anoints you, the devil is aware. And he will stop at nothing to cut you off. Because he knows that the destiny of a thousand people is connected to you. And if you don't understand priesthood, so the next thing we see about a mediator from the life of Moses, number two, is that a mediator is one who has gained mastery in priesthood and spiritual intelligence. Mastery in priesthood and spiritual intelligence. Even his wife knew what to do to save his life. And you will see several times that Moses had to incorporate this to bring salvation for Israel when they left Egypt and they were in the wilderness. Number three thing we see about Moses is that Mo you, from the, li of the life of a mediator, is that a mediator is one who upholds the place of consecration in fasting and prayer. Deuteronomy 9 verse 9 to 10. It's probably the last scripture and then we'll pray. So from Moses' life, from the two scriptures, we have deduced that a mediator is one who has mastery in priesthood and spiritual intelligence. So even his wife knew what to do to save his life. Another thing we see about a mediator from the life of Moses is one who upholds the place of consecration in fasting and prayer. You want to learn how to stand between God and men. You must understand the place of fasting and prayer. Deuteronomy 9 verse 9 to 10, 18 to 20 and 25. When I went up into the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant which the Lord made with you, then... I did what? Look at your screen. Then I did what? I did what? I did what? On the mountain. How many days? 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water. To go and receive co commandment. Now, the Bible says tablet of the covenant. That means that those laws were a seal of the covenant that God had with Israel. But it had to be sealed by the sacrifice of one man in fasting and prayer. So for God to cut covenant with a family, so that that family can secure the favor and the blessings of God, one man must pay a price. And to receive laws, Moses had to stay 40 days and 40 nights. Verse 10. Then the Lord, as though the Lord waited for that fast, then the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And on them were all the words which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. Verse 18 to 20. 
you think that was the only time Moses went up the mountain 40 days and I fell down before the Lord another time again as at the first 40 days and 40 nights I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all your sin which you committed in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger go on for I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure with which the Lord was angry with you to destroy you but the Lord listened to me at that time also go on and the Lord was very angry with Aaron and would have destroyed him even though Aaron was anointed God still wanted to destroy Aaron because while Moses was on, on the mountain Aaron made golden calves for the children of Israel he broke their first law as an anointed priest and God wanted to destroy Aaron he says, so I prayed for Aaron also at the same time. Verse 25, last verse. We are about to pray now. Thus I prostrated myself before the Lord. Forty days and forty nights. I kept prostrating, I kept prostrating. I kept prostrating. Hmm. This is another thing you learn from a mediator. Humility. Write it down. That's number four. Because to prostrate or, the, or to lie down symbolize humility in those days. When they lie down like that, they lie down on dust. Imagine that you dress fine with perfume. And then you have to lie down on the dust to beg a man. That's a state of humility, isn't it? So number three. One who understands consecration in the place of fasting and prayer. Moses was a man that understood the power of fasting and prayer. You cannot be a mediator and be used by God to bring deliverance to a nation or to a family if you don't understand the place of fasting and prayer. There has to be a price. Everything you see that God has to offer, there is a price for it including God to have all of God there is a price the blood of Jesus was the price for salvation but the price for intimacy is consecration that one the blood of Jesus will not secure it for you one man had to pay the price when was the last time you went before God in the place of fasting and prayer until you saw the hand of God move in your family when was the last time or you saw an affliction trying to destroy a loved one if only the church of Christ will rise in Nigeria in Africa and pray and seek God in fasting and prayer there's too much modernization in the church now we now have mega churches and there's no problem with that but in our mega-ness we have forgotten the old rules of the game we have replaced the main things with trivial issues the church no longer prays again believers no longer spend time to fast to stay before god a man had to go up for 40 days without food just to get low that means that there is a dimension of understanding in the word of God that you will not receive if you don't appropriate prayer and fasting. I'm not preaching law. I'm not, I'm not, this is, I'm not trying to say you cannot. I'm just showing you the way. So he said, Apostle, anytime I read the Bible, I sleep. Try reading fasting. You know one thing I like with fasting? When you truly enter into fasting, that sleep that used to come on you in prayers, it will disappear. Because the hunger in your stomach, at, at least the noise in your stomach, because of the emptiness of that stomach, will be so loud like a headphone to your ear. you wake up from that sleep. Friends, there's power in prayer and fasting. In 2020, I lost my mom in 28th of April. Now, I didn't feel bad because shortly before she died, God showed me he was taking her. So that pacified me. And then went for the burial. We finished everything. I came back. 
And then we resumed meetings and we continued. And then all of a sudden, I got a call from home that my dad was sick. All through my life, I've never known him sick. Talk more of going to the hospital for himself. He was my champion as far as divine health and long life is concerned. And the story came that he was sick. I thought it was not serious. Till the next time they called me and said he was in the hospital. He passed out. And he could not eat. They had to sustain him with drip. That was when I knew that if I don't do something about this, affliction will rise again. Now, how will people feel when they hear that he lost his two parents in one year? You know, if that happened, and with what God is doing in our midst today, it will be easy for somebody to say he sacrificed his two parents. Yes or no? Not knowing that whatever they see now may be a consolation for that one. I knew that all hell was, had broken loose. There is a time where even the anointed can fall. It takes mediators to rise. You know what? I switched off my phone. I shut my door. And I laid down before God on the ground for two days. No food. You see, that food that you like, that you don't want to leave. Don't wait till a situation comes that, that kills your appetite. Don't wait. I'm not saying eating is not good. It's good though. But any man you see that has so much pleasure and has time for food, he doesn't have too much problem or he's probably not responsible. Because when you have responsibility on your head, the food will not be sweet. Food, my dad was in the hospital. I kept it aside. I laid there before God until the second night when I switched on my phone, I saw a text. That he was fine and they are taking him back according to the diagnosis he had pneumonia from where moses went before god otherwise god would have slain them i don't have time i would have showed you numbers chapter 14. another time came when moses was standing before god with aaron the people had grumbled and god wanted to destroy them god told him he said leave these people let me destroy them the first time he had begged God, God accepted. This time God was not going to listen to apology. The Bible says, while Moses was before God on the ground, he told Aaron, he said, stand up. Go and take an incense. Take a censer, put incense. And stand, go in between the people and stand there. All of these are principles that a mediator must understand. And the Bible says in that Numbers 14, that Aaron stood between the living and the dead. In other words, the plague had broke out among the people and they were dying. But because Aaron obeyed the instruction of priesthood, as soon as he got there with the incense, the death, the hand of death was stayed off. Meanwhile, Moses kept lying down where he was before God. You know why? Because somebody had to be there begging God. Otherwise, the anger of God was supposed to wipe off. That explains the fourth principle, which is humility. He said, my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves. You see, if we humble ourselves and truly pray, God will show up in the next elections. If we can humble ourselves and truly cry before God, if we can strip ourselves of our title and stand before God in prayers and seek his intervention, you will see how that night can be changed today in your family. There's nothing God cannot move. There's no situation God cannot solve. God only needs in mediators. And friends, there must be the rise of mediators in our time. How many of us want God to use us? You want to be a mediator in your time. You want to be a go-between for your generation. You want to see that through you, God can bring an end to a crisis and begin a new season of prosperity. It doesn't just happen. God does not work by luck or chance. No. The Bible says time and chance happened to them all, not you. Time and chance is for unbelievers and animals. You, your time comes when light has come on you. The light that has come to us today is the light that God needs to raise men as mediators. Even as a worshiper, you can be a mediator. 
God may not be interested in a concert, but because of your presence on that stage, God will come. You know, there are a lot of programs we put up these days just for showmanship. But if a mediator stands on that stage, if God had gone on a journey somewhere, God will come back there. A mediator is like a mast, like an empty mast that stands in a place and it traps network. When Boko Haram was invading territories, the first thing they do when they get to a place is dislodge communications. That's why I came to tell you the reason why the attacks on your life is too much is because you are a mediator that God raised. It is because of you the light of God is not out of that family. But this night, God wants to awaken us. He wants to put so much strength. Don't worry about your infirmities. He will heal you. Don't worry about your weakness. He will make you strong. If only you are willing to partner with him tonight. Can we rise as we pray? Four things I told you about a mediator. Number one is one that in initiates divine intervention. Number two is one who has gained mastery in priesthood and spiritual intelligence. Number three is one who upholds the place of consecration in, the, in fasting and prayer. Number four is one who understands humility. I want you tonight to lift your voice and say, Father, if you are looking for a man in my generation, if you are looking for a man in my family, you have found one. Lift your voice and pray. By your prayer, I understand, or I can know if you truly understood what God was saying tonight. There are so many noisemakers. There are so many jokers. There are so many charlatans. But there are few mediators. There are so many pastors. There are so many ministers. But there are few mediators. God, if you are looking for a man in my generation, you have found one. Use me for your glory. Lift your voice and pray. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. I can't hear you, Pneumatic. I can't hear you. You don't have to be motivated to pray. You don't have to be stirred up. The Bible says men ought always to pray. That prayer is a declaration you are making to God. I'm ready for you to use me. I'm ready for you to invest the strength of a thousand men. Let God find you as a Deborah. Let God find you as a Gideon. Let God find you as a Samuel. As a Daniel. Darkness can be blotted out in that family, in that territory. If God finds a mediator, the gates of hell will truly not prevail if God has mediators in his church. Say God, I don't want to go with the crowd. I want to be used by you. I don't just want to be a casual Christian. I don't just want to be a normal Christian. I want to be a mediator. I want to be an individual sister for the defense of territorial integrity. I want you to be powerful in my generation because of me. Shilla, but the 
of that song we are going to sing it is an anthem get the lyrics now project it on the stage on on the screen we are going to sing it now everything i've been through use it for your glory that's the anthem of a mediator that lyrics and project it we are going to sing it but listen to me we we'll worship God for a few minutes with this song and make a solemn declaration some of us we know we know that this is what God wants to do with you some of you God wants to raise you as intercessors in the place of prayer listen to me everybody listen some of you God wants to raise you as a financial giant to liberate an entire clan from poverty. Some of us here, your breakthrough is the breakthrough of an entire family. Some of us, God wants to raise you as prophets that will speak forth his purposes to the nations, that will reveal his light, that will bring men out of the bondage of darkness. But let me tell you something. To be a mediator, there are sacrifices. There are prizes you must pay. And probably we have been running away from it too long. Some of us have become too comfortable with just serving God in one level. God is calling you to a higher place. But you have become too comfortable. Because you know that for you to step into your original calling and fulfill destiny, you will have to be inconvenienced. But this night God has sent me here. He's still calling you again. Some of you have been running from this call for five years, ten years, fifteen years. Some of you are hiding as businessmen and women. Meanwhile, there's a pastoral anointing on your life. The people and the things you complain about, the reason why there seems to be no change year in, year out, is because God raised you. There's no fire in your church. It's because God raised you as a watchman. But there are too many things taking away our distractions. Or distracting us taking away our time and we must be consecrated to the services of God we must be raised by God to be used can you make a sacrifice this night as you listen to me to step out of your convenience and decide that no matter what it takes God will find me as a bridge by which he can interfere and bring deliverance and bring hope and bring restoration how many people have died in your family because there was no watchman? Please, no movement anywhere. This is a solemn moment. This night, God is going to conscript some mediators amongst us. But we need to sing that song as an anthem to God, as a sacrifice. 
Now, as we sing it in worship, let me tell you one the reason why worship seems to be powerful. In worship, God is magnified. And he's magnified till he becomes bigger than your problem. And that's when he steps in for you. Are we ready tonight? Lift your hands everywhere. Lord, I offer you. Lord, I offer my life to you. Everything I've been through. Use it for your glory. Lord, I offer my days. I offer my days to you. Lifting my praise to you. As a pleasing sound, Lord, I offer you my life, Lord, I offer you. From the top, Lord, I offer my life to you. Lift your hands and sing it to him. As a pleasing sacrifice, I offer my days, I offer my body, I offer my life, my finances. From the top, sing. Lord, I offer my life to you. Everything I do. Use it, Lord. Use it. Lord, I offer you my life. Just the voices. Lord, I offer my life to you. Everything I've been through. Use it for your glory. And Lord, Lord, I offer you my life. Lord, I offer you my life. Let's sing the second stanza. Lord, I offer my days to you. Lifting my praise to you. Lord, I offer you my life. 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 Sing, Lord, I offer you my life. Lord, I offer you my life. I put it on the altar of sacrifice. Lord, I As you sing it, you are making a declaration to him. Lord, I offer you are giving him your life in prayers, in fastings. You are responding to the call of ministry. You are responding to the call of destiny. You are responding to his call as an intercessor. As a giant for the kingdom. As a soldier for the kingdom, I will serve you for the rest of my days. Lord, I offer you my life. Lord, I offer you my life. Now, while we stand, before we pray the last prayer tonight, and we are done, if you are here under this holy atmosphere, and you need to say yes to Jesus, you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life. We do this every Sunday. 
there are souls that must be saved. There are hearts that must be drawn to Jesus as their Savior and as their Lord. Or perhaps you are here. You used to be a Christian on fire for God and serving even in the church. But certain things have happened in your life recently and you feel that you have derailed and you want to return back. Wherever you are, I want you to raise your right hand high and I'll pray for you where you are. We do this and then we'll pray the last prayer. Raise your right hand high. I want to give this opportunity and then we are done tonight. Hallelujah. Wave your hands and give God praise. Thank you for your presence. Now listen to me. We are going to pray. The presence of God is so strong here. We are going to take five minutes because of time. And we are going to intercede for our families. Listen to me. I want you to pray desperately. The last scripture we read was in Deuteronomy. Where Moses said he prostrated. Many days before the Lord. There is something that God can do from your prayers. There are families represented here that are in dire need of divine intervention. There are people here that must experience a shift. There are certain things, certain yokes in our families, in the life of a loved one or a sibling that needs to be broken. It seems like God has answered every other thing, but this one thing is not changing. There are some of us that have siblings that are struggling with all kinds of addictions. There are some of us that are in families where there are crises. The only one enjoying peace is you. There are some of us that have loved ones that must be saved. Please don't walk out of this door until you have prayed this prayer. And if you are following us online, we are going to take the next five minutes to intercede. I want you to take any position that you can. But I want you to pray desperately from your heart. Listen, I didn't say pray meditative prayer. No. I want you to pray like you are trying to rescue somebody from a burning house. The Bible says Abraham went back early in the morning and he stood there in that place before God. More like telling God, Lord, remember. This night you want to pray and say, Lord, remember my family and have mercy. Let there be a shift. Let there be a change. Let that expectation that is long awaited come true. If you don't have any prayer point to pray or you feel there is no need to intercede, no problem. You can sit down. After the prayers, you join us. But I'm calling on a few people this night that know that the devil's hand must be stayed off their family. That know that certain afflictions must come to an end. That know that certain patterns must be broken. In the next five minutes, I want you, wherever you are, the position you take, Raise your voice to heaven. Let the heavens hear you. Let the heavens hear your intercession. Just the strings and the cymbals. I want them to pray. I want to hear them pray. The Bible says Moses prostrated before the Lord. And God repented of his anger. The prayer of a man can turn the hand of God. The prayer of one man can withhold divine judgment. The prayer of one man can block out darkness in a family. Let me hear the prayer of the saints. Let me hear the prayer of the saints. Let me hear the prayer of the mediators. Oh God, Christ, have mercy. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on my father's house. Have mercy on my mother's house. Remember us. Take this darkness away. Break the patterns. Break the cycles. Break the demonic yokes. Come on, you are not praying. Online pray. Let the spirit of prayer erupt in every territory. To everyone 
If there is a man to pray, there is a God to answer. That breakthrough can come. That healing can come. That miracle can come. But a man must stand. Without man, God, can, God will not. Without man, God will not. Let the destiny of man be released. Let the fiber come. Who calls on Jesus? He beats. There's gonna be a new awakening. There's gonna be a new revival in our land. There's gonna be a new awakening. 
Please rise on your feet, everybody. He is worthy to receive the glory and the praise he has prevailed. He has prevailed. Please lift your hands. I want to make prophetic declarations now and I want you to believe what I'm about to declare. There's a shift in the spirit. It says, weep not. The lion of Judah, the offspring of David, has prevailed. Father, on the strength of the intercession of your children, I declare, let the hand of death be restrained. In fact, I'm seeing two families here that I'm praying that for in particular. I rebuke the hand of death from your family. In the name of the Lord Jesus, let lost destinies be restored. Let prodigal sons and daughters be returned. Let everything that was lost be restored in the name of Jesus. Let affliction go. Let sickness go. Let infirmity cease.